My thoughts today are thoughts that I have spent a lot of time on. They're thoughts that I am trying to apply to my life. Love's flagship. Do you see the people hiding in the house? That's you and me. The folks ducking behind the stairwell, that's us. We're avoiding the bill collectors. This is the eve of the eviction. The bank has given us one day to pay the mortgage Credit cards are camped on the front lawn. The loan sharks have our number on speed dial. But we are broke. I've been there. We've peddled our last food stamp and the water is disconnected, the car repossessed, the furniture picked up, and now the IRS is knocking on the door. He wants back taxes. I know you are there. They yell, open up. So we do. He tells us how much we owe. We remind him that turnips don't give blood. He mentions jail. And now that point, a warm bed out of the reach of the creditors, doesn't sound that bad. Just as he motions for the sheriff, his cell phone rings. It's Washington. The president wants a word with us, an explanation from us. We have none. No silence, no defense, only a plea or patience. He listens in silence and asks to speak with the agent again. And as the president speaks, the suit nods and says, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He closes his phones and looks first at you and then at me. I don't know who you know, but your debt is paid. He says, tearing up the papers and letting the pieces fall to the floor. Maybe you didn't know God did that for us. Maybe no one has told you about God's patience and willingness to put up with you. Read Romans 2.4. Could have you dozed off the day the pastor read Psalms 103.8. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love? If so, no wonder you've been edgy. No wonder you've been impatient. Bankruptcy can put the best of us in a foul mood. You know what you need to do. 
step out on the porch, stand where the IRS guy stood and look at those papers, the torn pieces scattered and thrown across the lawn and stare at the proof of God's patience. You were in debt. Those times you used his name only when you cussed. God, have, God could have blown up at you, but he didn't. He was patient. Those thousand sunsets you never thanked him for. And I can remember when I lived in Arizona at Camp Yava Pines. In the evening, the beautiful sunsets, the, the purples, the orange, the it, it was amazing. He could have put you on beauty rations, but he didn't. He was patient. Those Sabbaths you strutted into church to show off the new dress, it's a wonder he didn't strike you naked. But he didn't. He was patient. And oh, my, those promises. Get me out of this and I will never tell another lie. Count me to stand up for you from now on and I've done with the temper tantrums. If broken promises were lumber, we could build a subdivision. Doesn't God have ample reason to walk out on us? But he doesn't. Why? Because God is being patient with you. We'll read that in Peter, the Second Peter, the third chapter, verses nine. Paul presents patience as the premier expression of love. Positioned at the head of the apostles' love of Mara, a bot length or two in front of kindness, courtesy, forgiveness. This is the flagship known as patience. Love is patient. The Greek word used here for patience is a descriptive one. It figuratively means taking a long time to boil. Now think about a pot of boiling water. The size of the stove? No. The pot? Mm. The essential may have an influence, but the primary factor is the intensity of the flame. Water boils quickly when the flame is high, and it boils slowly when it is low. Patience keeps the burner down. Helpful clarification, don't you think? Patience isn't naive. It doesn't ignore misbehavior. It just keeps the flame low. It waits, it listens, it's slow to boil. This is how God treats us. And according to Jesus, this is how we should treat others. He once told a parable about the king who decides to settle his accounts with his debtors. His bookkeeper surfaces a fellow 
who owes not thousands or hundreds, but millions of dollars. The king similarly declares that the man and his wife and kids are to be sold to pay the debt. Because of his inability to pay, the man is about to lose everything and everyone dear to him. No wonder the man fell down before the king and begged him, O oh, sir, be patient with me, and I will pay it all. Then the king was filled with pity for him, and he released him and forgave him his debt. You can read about that in Matthew 18, 26 through 27. The word patience makes a sunrise appearance here. The debtor does not plead for mercy or forgiveness. He pleads for patience. Equally curious is the singular appearance of the word. <coughs> Jesus used it twice in this story and never again. It appears, every, it appears nowhere else in the Gospels. And perhaps the scarce usage is the first century equivalent of a highlighter. Jesus reserves the word for one occasion to make one point. Patience is more than a virtue of long lines and slow waiters. Patience is the red carpet upon which God's grace approaches us. I want to read that again. Patience is the red carpet upon which God's grace approaches us. Had there been no patience, there would have been no mercy. But the king was patient. And the man with the multi-million dollar debt was forgiven. And the man with the multi-million dollar debt was forgiven because the king was patient. Thank you. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars, and he grabbed the man by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient, and I will pay it. He pleaded, but his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and thrown into jail until the debt could be paid. The king is stunned. How could the man be so impatient? How dare the man be so impatient? The ink of the cancel stamp is still moist on the man's bills. And wouldn't you expect a little Mother Teresa-ness out of him? You'd think that the person who'd been forgiven for much would love much, but he didn't. And his lack of love led to a costly mistake. The forgiving servant is called back to the castle. You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison until he had paid 
every penny. The king's patience made no difference in the man's life. To the servant, throne room mercy was nothing more than a canceled test, a dodged bullet, a get out of jail free card. He wasn't stunned by the royal grace. He was relieved he hadn't been punished. He was given much patience, but gave none, which make us wonder. If he actually understood the gift he had received. If you find patience hard to give, you might ask the same question. How infiltrated are you with God's patience? You've heard about it, read about it, perhaps underlined it in the Bible passages regarding it, but have you received it? The proof is your patience. Patience deeply received results in patience freely offered. But patience never received leads to an abundance of problems, not the least of which is prison. Remember where the king sent the forgiving servant when the angry king sent the man to prison until he had paid every penny? Wow, we sigh. Glad that story is a parable. Isn't a good thing God doesn't imprison the impatient in real life? Don't be so sure he doesn't. Self-absorption and ingratitude make for thick walls and lonely jails. Impatience still imprisons the soul. For that reason, our God is quick to help us avoid it. He does more than demand patience from us. He offers it to us. Patience is the fruit of the Spirit. It hangs from the tree, Galatians 5.22. The Spirit produces the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience. Have you asked God to give you the fruit? Well, I did once, but but what? And I need to ask him time and time again. Patience is something that I have a difficult time with sometimes. And some may have realized that. Ask him again and again and again. He won't grow impatient with your pleading and you will receive patience in your praying. And while you're praying, ask for understanding. Patient people have great understanding. Could it be your impatience stems from a lack of understanding? Mine has. Some time ago, I had the wonderful opportunity to attend several pastoral conferences at the Crystal Cathedral. I was especially interested in one class, so I arrived early and snagged the front row seat. And as the speaker began, 
However, I was distracted by a couple of voices in the back of the room. Two guys were mumbling to each other, and I was giving serious thought of shooting a glare over my shoulder when the speaker announced and offered an explanation. Forgive me, he said. I forgot to explain why the two fellows at the back of the back of the class are talking. One of them is an elder at a new church in Romania. He has traveled here to learn about church leadership, but he doesn't speak English. And so the message is being translated. And I've had that happen, especially in Arizona, where at the camp meeting, we provided translation for the uh, Hispanic folks that would attend camp meeting. It was being translated. And there would be a bit of, bit of noise to people around them. All of a sudden, everyone in that room, it was changed. Patience replaced impatience. Why? Because patience always hitches a ride with understanding. The man, wise man says, a man of understanding holds his tongue. Proverbs 11, 12. He also says, a man of understanding is even-tempered. You'll find that in Proverbs 17, 27. Don't miss the connection between understanding and patience. Before you blow up, listen up. Before you strike out, tune in. It takes wisdom to have a good family, and it takes understanding to make it strong. Proverbs 24, 3. Before anything else, love is patient. For an example, let me share with you a story that goes way back to the Holocaust. Ellie Weasel is a correspondent for the Jewish newspaper. A decade earlier, he was a prisoner in the Jewish concentration camp, and a decade earlier, he would be known as the author of Night, the Pulitzer, the Pulitzer Prize-winning account of the Holocaust. Eventually, he'll be awarded the Congressional Medal of Achievement and the Nobel Peace Prize. But today, Elliot Weasel is a 26-year-old unknown newspaper correspondence. He is about to interview the French author, Franc Franciscus Maurice, who is a devout Christian. Now, Maurice is France's most recent Nobel laureate for literature and an expert on French political life. Weasel shows up at Maurice's apartment, nervous, he was a chain smoker, his emotions still frayed from the German horror, his comfort as a writer still raw. The older Maurice tries to put him at ease and he invites him, he invites e Weasel in and the two sit in a small room. Before Weasel can ask a question, however. Maurice, a staunch Roman Catholic, begins to speak 
about his favorite subject. And you know, I had the wonderful experience of working with a group of Catholic men that I had learned to love at Camp Yeva Pines when they would come for their weekend of worship. And it was always a pleasure to talk to them about my favorite subject, Jesus. And I'm concerned that I sing sometimes, and I'm gonna maybe get on my horse a little bit. I don't think we spend enough time with Jesus. We spend too much time with the incidentals of sometimes prophecy and other things and not a time, enough time with him. Jesus. Weasel grows uneasy in the name of Jesus is a pressed thumb in his infected wounds. Weasel tries to reroute the conversation they are having, but he can't. It is a thought. Everything in creation leads back to Jesus. Jerusalem. Jerusalem is where Jesus ministered. Old Testament, because of Jesus, the Old Testament is now enriched by the new. Maurice turns every topic towards the Messiah. The anger in Weasel begins to heat. The Christian anti-Semitism He'd grown up with the layers of grief from sight, from Auschwitz, from the buck, buck and wall. It all boils over. He puts away his pen, shuts his notebook, and stands up angrily. Sir, he said to the still seated Maurice, you speak of Christ. Christians love to speak of him and the passion of Christ, the agony of Christ, the death of Christ. In your religion, that is all you speak of. Well, I want you to know that 10 years ago, not very far from here, I knew Jewish children, every one of them whom suffered a thousand times more, six million times more than Christ on the cross. And as we speak about them, can you understand that, sir? We don't speak about them. Maurice was stunned. Weasel turns and marches out the door and Maurice sits in shock, his woolen blanket still wrapped around him, and the young reporter is pressing the elevator button when Maurice appears in the hall. He gently reaches for Weasel's arm. Come back, he explores. Weasel agrees, and the two sit on the sofa, sofa. And at this point, Maurice Reese begins to weep. He looks at Weasel, but says nothing, just tears. Weasel starts to apologize. Maurice will have nothing to do with it. Instead, he urges his young friend to talk. He wants to hear about it, the camps the trains, the death. He asked Weasel why he hasn't put this to paper. Weasel tells him the pain is too severe. He makes a vow of silence, and the older man tells him to break it 
and speak out. The evening changed them both. The drama became the soil of a lifelong friendship. They corresponded until Maurice's death in 1970, and I owe Francis Maurice my career. Weasel has said, and it was to Maurice that Weasel sent the first manuscript of night. What if Maurice had kept the door shut? Would anyone have blamed him? Would you have blamed him? Cut by the sharp words of Weasel, he could have become, become impatient with anger, young man, and have been glad to be rid of him, but he didn't. And he wasn't. He re reacted decisively, quickly, lovingly. He was slow to boil. And because he was, a heart began to heal. May I urge you to do the same? God is being patient with you, patient with me, Second Peter 3, 9. And if God is being patient with you, can't you pass on some patience to others? Of course you can. Because before love is anything else, love is patient. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, grant us the patience that we can love and we can reach out and we can be there for others. Bless us this day. Grant us peace and love. I pray in Christ's name. Amen.